Um, this is one of my favorite uh, webinars to do because over the last few months, um, I know I've gotten to see some of you guys in information sessions. We've emailed about things. I know you've had questions and we've kind of gone back and forth over email. I know with, with a lot of you. Um, and now I get to finally see you on a Teams call. Um, this is a very important Teams call because this is going to be um, what you need to know to get yourself registered for your first semester classes. And then before you know it, you're going to be here at UTD and we're going to see each other in person um, right here on campus. So um, I'm super excited to, to chat with you guys today um, and definitely happy to answer your questions. So um, uh, again, thanks for, for joining me. Um, for those of you who I've not met, uh, my name is John Fierst and I am the program director for both the MS in Supply Chain Management and the MS in Management Science programs here in the Jindal School of Management at UTD. Um, so those are our two master's degrees housed in the operations management department. Um, all of us in the department are very excited to meet you guys um, when you get started with your classes either this summer or this fall. Um, so I did want to kind of do a, a brief intro um, as to who I am so you know who the name is behind all the emails that you're getting. Um, so I'm actually a staff member here in the department. Um, I'm not faculty, so I don't teach. I don't do research. Um, I am the instructor of the internship course. So whenever you go off and do an internship and get credit for it, I will be the instructor for that credit that you earn um, towards your degree. But other than that, my full time job really is to support you as applicants, new students um, coming into the program, um, and then supporting you while you are a student here, and then engaging with you when you're an alum um, out in the world doing amazing things. Um, so I love my job because it is full time dedicated to helping students. So just know that you can always come to me with any questions that you may have. 50% um, of the time with new students, um, I, I'm not the actual office or person that you should talk to about your question, but I know who on campus you should talk to. So I'll tell you, hey, um, I don't actually know the answer to that question, but you should email this person or you should reach out to that office um, to get the answer to your question. So I'm always happy to help direct you and, and get your questions answered, even if I'm not the person who ends up actually answering the question. Um, I'm originally from the state of Indiana. I grew up in the Midwest. Um, if you know where Chicago is, um, I'm kind of from that Great Lakes region. Um, I've been in Texas now for almost eight years, though, so I've um, been down here for, for quite a while. Um, started at UT Dallas in July of 2022, so I'm coming up on one full year here at UTD. Um, if you have any kind of program questions, like I said, um, you're always welcome to, to reach out um, and you can totally call me John. Um, you don't have to call me Mr. Fierce or Professor Fierce or anything like that. Um, you can just address me as John. I'm totally cool with that. Um, so, so yeah, let's go ahead and dive right into some of this important um, registration information so that we can get you on your way um, towards your first semester. So the first thing that I do want to make a distinction on um, is our graduate advising team versus me. So I, as the program director, am not actually your academic advisor. We have a team of academic advisors here in the Jindal School of Management um, to help with um, kind of those academic advising registration type issues. Now, um, you can reach them at jsomgradvising at utdallas.edu if you ever have any kind of registration questions or uh, <clears throat> issues that, that arise there. Um, if you have questions about which courses to take um, or understanding the concentrations and tracks within the degree program, um, reporting an internship, that kind of thing, then then you can come to me um, for those for those kinds of questions. Um, the other thing that I want to mention here, you see that first bullet point, um, please check your Orion account for any holds that are on your account. Um, typically with holds uh, as a new student, if it's a, like a TB test hold or an admissions documents hold, those are holds that may not necessarily be removed right away, but the office that administers that hold might be able to push the hold back into, you know, later this summer or into like August or September so that you are allowed to register at this time. So often if you have to reach out to an office um, saying, hey, can you remove my hold rather than asking for the hold to be removed. You'll just say, hey, can you push back my hold into the fall semester so that I can enroll and add drop my classes now? So that's just a quick note about holds because um, sometimes people get a little confused as to how those affect their their account. 
Now, this is another important thing, um, especially after today. I'm going to start communicating with you via your UTD email. So it is very important that you go ahead and log in to your UTD email and, and use it um, to communicate with me, to communicate with advising, with other people at the university. It's it's a very important um, uh, tool to use as you gear up to, to come here. So um, for this webinar, I have been using your personal email to like reach out to you um, because I think that until people see this webinar, they don't quite understand that it is very important to read their UTD email. So you probably got this invitation in your personal email. But starting uh, you know, after today, um, I'll be using just your UTD email. So it's very important to, um, to log into that. All right. So um, the first piece in kind of getting your class schedule together is to be able to use Coursebook. So Coursebook really is our um, kind of master schedule for all of our terms and all of our courses here on campus. Now, our summer and fall methods of instruction are firm. So it's very important that you know which type of course that you're signing up for before you add it to your schedule. So the first type of course that we have is a traditional course. That means it has a classroom and a meeting time. It's like a normal class. Then we have two forms of online courses. There's online asynchronous, and those have a 0 W1 or 0 W2 section number. And an asynchronous course has no meeting room and no class time. That means you kind of work on it throughout the week on your own time. Um, you're not required to log in at a certain day and time um, in order to complete that class. Then we have this new form of class called online synchronous, which means it is an online class. It'll probably be indicated by either a 5W1 or an OW1 um, section number, but you're going to see a meeting room and required class. Uh, sorry, you're, you're not going to see a meeting room, but you're going to see a required class time. So that means that maybe Tuesdays at 7 p.m., you got to log on to your computer to join the class, right? You don't have to be here on campus to join the class, but you do need to have your laptop open and and you know be engaged in the course um, from wherever it is that you are on that that day and time. So um, I'm going to pull up Coursebook over here onto the screen. Hopefully this looks familiar if you've um, had a chance to log uh, uh, go to Coursebook. Um, I'm here on the guided search tab. And this is where you can go um, put in the term that you want to look for courses in. So fall 2023 is the default. If you need summer courses, you'll just select summer here. And then go to the class prefix, and this is how you'll search kind of department by department. Supply chain students, your department and basically all of your classes or the vast majority of your classes are coming from OPRE, operations research. So if I select OPRE um, and then I click search, that's going to bring up all of, of the supply chain classes. Um, for management science students, you're probably going to be taking classes from a number of different prefixes here in JSON. So you'll want to, um, to look and, and find the prefix that makes sense for what you want to take. And we'll talk about which classes are in your degree plan here in the next couple slides. So don't worry about this for, for now. But then once I'm ready to see that department's classes, I can just click search. And now I can see, OK, all of the fall classes um, from supply chain. As a graduate student, you're going to be looking for 6,000 level courses. So all these ones that start with three and four, those are for the undergrad students. You start at the 6,000 level. So right here, OPRE 6301, from here on down, those are all of our classes for master's students, anything in the 6,000 level. If you see a 7,000 level course here at the bottom, those are for PhD students, so you can ignore those. So you want to look for things that are uh, that start with a six and that'll show you all of the classes that we have available so for example if you um uh, i'm going to use the stats class as an example because that's something that basically everybody's going to enroll in um we have multiple sections of of statistics here one two three four five you can see that these are traditional classes there's a day there's a time there's a room and then we have an online section ow1 and look at that there's no meeting room and no time. So this is a, an asynchronous online course. So now I know if I'm signing up for section 005, I'm going to be with Dr. Ahadi on Mondays at 1 p.m. in this room. But if I sign up for OW1, I'm going to be in an online course taught by Dr. Leach. Um, but there is no time that I have to log on um, to the to the class. So um, this is a very important tool to familiarize yourself with, coursebook.utdallas.edu. It's going to give you all the schedule information that you need. 
Um, oh, one other thing I should mention in, in course book, um, the syllabus and uh, uh, instructor CVs. So if you are interested in knowing a little bit more about the course, what does the course cover? Um, you can click on syllabus and that'll take you to the syllabus. Now, here's the thing about summer and fall. The syllabi for those classes are not required to be posted until like the first day of class. So you'll actually need to go back a semester to see what that class covers. So you can pull up our spring classes and all of these, um, if we scroll back down to 6301, for example, all of these will have this little syllabus link right here. Then we can click on the syllabus and actually see what courses, uh, what, what topics are being covered in that class. So if you want to get that full syllabus information, you'll want to go back to spring 2023, which are the classes happening right now. Then you can see the syllabus for those courses. The courses that you sign up for, um, the syllabi will be posted once we get um, a little bit later into the summer and, and when the semester begins. Now, the syllabus could be a little bit different between spring and fall if the instructor changes something, but generally speaking, our classes are very consistent because they have to cover essentially the same topics semester to semester. So it's a very good way to get a, a sense of um, what's going to be covered in that in that particular course. All right, um, Sam Rudy, I just saw your question here in the chat. Um, do spring classes and fall classes not differ? Um, the content of the courses typically is not all that different. So using the syllabus from this current semester is a good way to get a very good sense of what's going to be covered in the class. Um, but the, but the the uh, the courses that are being offered by a department could vary from spring to fall. So you might see a class that is offered in the spring but not offered in the fall or you could see a class that is offered in the fall, but not being offered this spring. So sometimes there are some classes that are only offered once a year um, and you'll only see them you know, in, in one of those semesters. All right, so let's go ahead and move on here um, into registering for classes. Um, just a quick, uh, if I can get a reaction from folks, if you have registered yourself for classes before in your bachelor's degree, can you give me a reaction? If you have done a, a registration process on your own, you've gone into a system, you've picked your classes, and you've clicked enroll for yourself, you kind of self-serviced uh, in, enroll. Okay, a few folks have. Okay, great. Now, I know that there are um, a number of students who were in bachelor's degree programs where they didn't really have to do that, right? Maybe the university or the college gave that gave you your schedule um, and you didn't actually have to navigate a registration system and pick things on your own. Um, the college just said, here's your schedule and go. Um, so that can be sometimes very different, right? For students to come into our system of registration um, and say, wait, I have to do all of this on my own and I have to understand what I'm adding to my, to my schedule. So I know that that can feel kind of different if that's not actually what you're used to. Um, but hopefully for those of you who have done registration on your own, this will feel a little familiar. Um, so, it, so again, if you need help, our advising team is there to help you in terms of kind of navigating that registration system, um, if, because I know that that can feel kind of foreign sometimes. So if you have questions about a hold, um, reach out to the office associated with the hold. I'd kind of mentioned that before, that sometimes you have to reach out to an office and um, ask them to push a hold back so that you can register. Um, but if you're ever in doubt about that, you can also reach out to our advising team. Um, they work with hundreds of students every semester to get them registered, so chances are they could um, help direct you if there's a hold on your account that you're not exactly sure who to reach out to about or you're not sure how to resolve it. Um, so th they're very good at that. Um, a, a note about your official documents. You probably applied to UT Dallas with unofficial transcripts and unofficial scores and unofficial things, um, but we do need to receive your official certificates and official diplomas and official scores um, now that you are admitted. You do not need to have those official documents submitted in order to register for your first semester, but you do need to have those received by UT Dallas before you can register for your second semester, which would be spring of 2024. So it's very important to go ahead and get going on those official documents 
go ahead and send them in. Um, don't delay. Um, if, if you absolutely need to, you can physically bring the official documents with you when you travel to UTD. Um, but if you were on the, the webinar yesterday with Dr. Powell, she mentioned that that's kind of risky because what if you lose it? What if the envelope rips? Um, and and I, I get that. So I, I would encourage you if you if at all possible to go ahead and get started on sending your official stuff in now so that you don't run into any issues in like October when it's time to register for spring 2024 uh, spring 2024 classes. Um, another thing here, enrollment appointment. Um, hopefully you also went to the webinar yesterday and, and uh, heard from Karina, our director of advising about how to find your enrollment appointment. Um, you'll go into Orion, click manage my classes, and then there's going to be a big list, like a big column on the left hand side with a bunch of links. Um, you want to look for uh, your enrollment appointment from that from that list, and it'll basically give you a day and a time um, that you can start to add your classes. So chances are, for those of you who are new students, um, you know, coming in for summer or fall, I'm going to guess that your enrollment appointment is probably April 5th, 6th, or 7th. It's probably one of those days. Um, I have some continuing students who came in and chatted with me yesterday, and their enrollment appointments were April 4th. And enrollment is typically done, <clears throat> excuse me, on a priority basis. So our continuing students who are going to graduate in December, they kind of have first priority. Then our students who are graduating in May of 2024 have second priority. Then our first semester students have third priority. And then you as a brand new student are kind of at the at the bottom rung. Um, that's OK. Don't worry. Your priority moves up the farther you progress in your degree. Um, so my guess is that your enrollment appointment will probably be sometime between April 5th and April 8th. Um, Something like that would would be my guess, but but you'll see it in in Orion to know exactly um, what your day and time is. That is the time that you can start to actually enroll in classes, and I encourage you to make note of that enrollment appointment and add your classes as soon as possible, because as time goes on, some classes start to fill up. So um, you want to you know, get yourself a seat in the classes that you want to to uh, to take. Um, if you wait until like may to enroll or june to enroll then chances are you're not going to have as many options uh, for courses to pick from so it's best to try to enroll yourself as soon as possible to give yourself the best chance of getting into the the sections that you want and um, just so you know the credit hour limit for fall is 13 hours summer credit hour limit is seven credit hours and we'll talk about how that kind of uh, plays out here okay now i see a couple questions in the chat essel when is the deadline to register for fall classes um, technically, the deadline to register is August 17th, um, which, like I just said, is very, very late. Um, you don't want to wait until the deadline. Um, technically, late registration can happen after August 17th, um, but we don't want to wait that long. So, um, but but you can also uh, swap classes uh, after August 17th. So if you wanted to like change a section of a course, um, you know, the day before classes start, that's fine. Um, but as far as like actually adding the courses, you should definitely do that ASAP. But technically the, the deadline is August 17th. And then Krishna, you asked, will I have to pay the tuition fee as soon as I register for classes? The answer is no, you do not. Um, the, your tuition bill is not due until closer to the first day of class. Um, because we know that sometimes people will add courses and they have their schedule all ready to go. And then we get to like July 15th or something like that. And then they realize they can't get a visa appointment or they're not going to be able to make it. And then you can just drop all your classes. And um, if you need to defer your admission or something like that, that, that can happen. Um, so no, you, you're not expected to pay for your classes as soon as you register for them. That um, tuition billing due date will be later on in August. And since we're on that topic, um, I am going to go ahead and drop a link here in the chat so that you have the academic calendar, um, because this will have all of the deadlines um, that I think you guys have been asking about. So bookmark this page. Um, I just put it here in the chat. It's utdallas.edu slash academics slash calendar. And you can see actually all of the terms um, calendars on here. So currently you'll see like spring 2023 is like the table that's on there. Um, and then if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see like future terms and then it'll give you summer 2023 and then fall of 2023. So um, be sure to bookmark that because that'll give you all the deadlines for registration. Um, they haven't published the fall 2023 tuition payment deadline, but that will be published here soon. Um, so just check back on this page. Um, Gokul, you're admitted to two MS programs. Um, 
you can uh, if you're admitted to two programs, it actually shouldn't affect your ability to register. You'll just register into the classes that you want to take essentially. Um, so so your registration shouldn't be affected by um, by being admitted to two programs. You'll just follow the plan for whichever program you end up choosing. All right, let's go ahead and um, talk now about actually putting yourself in the classes. So um, a few reminders here in the system, um, putting a course in a shopping cart does not mean that you're done registering, right? So to add a course to your schedule, you want to click on finish enrolling and you'll see a green check mark and that'll tell you, yep, you're in the class. Um, there is a swap feature in the registration system that basically allows you to simultaneously drop a class and add a class all in one step. Um, you can use that swap feature if you like. Um, and just always verify to make sure that your schedule is the way that that you want it to be, um, that you are in fact enrolling in the classes that you you think you are. Um, and if you're ever in doubt about that, our advising team can double check your um, enrollment to make sure that it is in fact what you think it should be. Um, and then the other thing that I'm going to point out here is in course book, um, there's a five digit class number and every section of of a course has um, a five digit uh, uh, unique class number. So that's also one way to, to ensure that you're um, enrolling in the exact section that you think you are is to use that five digit course number. Um, but of course, every section of the course has a different number as well. So you can go by the section number too. So like we talked about in that example in course book, you know, OPRE 6301.005, um, that section number is still unique to that section of, of the course. Um, so you can also go by that. Quick note here on waitlist guidelines. Um, if a class is full, um, it typically will have a waitlist. And that means that you can put yourself on the waitlist so that if somebody in the class drops and a seat becomes available, you'll be added to the class when a seat becomes available. So if you see that little orange or yellowish triangle, um, that means that there is a section that has a waitlist. So um, there's a few guidelines here or a few things to know about waitlisting. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these right now because um, I'll send you these slides and you can read them. Most first semester students aren't going to need to be too fussed about waitlisting um, because your, your classes, we have plenty of capacity for you to, to get into your first semester required courses um, and plenty of elective options as well. Um, we're a big school, so we have lots of choices for you, um, but, but definitely feel free to review this information um, after today's webinar to make sure you understand kind of how the waitlist works if you end up needing to waitlist yourself for a course. Now, I do want to point out here at the bottom, have a backup plan for your classes, right? There, there's often um, a chance that, you know, you want to take a certain course, but um, the class is full. Um, so have some backup options in mind. It doesn't mean that you'll never be able to take that class. It might just mean that you need to take that class in your second semester or during your second year um, once you've moved up a little bit in that registration priority list. Um, so it's okay if you don't get your first choice classes, all good. Well, you know, you can totally take that class in a future semester. So just have some a few options in mind in terms of which classes you want to take in your first semester. OK, so let's talk about what you're actually enrolling in management science students. I am going to start with you guys. So this is a sample first semester schedule. Um, notice that you, the first thing I have on the list is Math 6102. That is your professional development course that everybody should take. Um, so add a section of that, and then everybody should be taking their statistics course in their first semester. And then I highly recommend another one of the core classes for management science, um, likely something like OPRE 6332, which is the spreadsheet modeling and analytics courses. Beyond those three classes, that's seven credit hours, um, maybe you take one or two more courses depending upon you know, your comfort level of how many classes you want to take. Um, you can do an additional core class or you could take an additional elective. Um, some people choose to take um, three classes in their first semester, three uh, like lecture courses, not minus the professional development class. Um, some people uh, elect to take four. So it kind of just depends on your comfort level. A full time graduate student is considered nine credit hours. Nine credit hours is three regular classes. Um, now I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. Our course numbering system will tell you the number of credit hours that a class is worth. So notice here, Mass 6102, 
The first number is a six. That means it's for master students. The second number is the number of credit hours. So all of your classes are going to start with like 63 and then professional development starts with 61 because it is a one credit hour course. And then everything else that you that you take is going to start with 63 because everything is three credit hours. So that's kind of a, a quick way to know, OK, is this class the right one for me to start with a six for master students and is it a three um, in this, the second digit? Um, that's how many credit hours it's worth. So um, a full time graduate student is nine credit hours. Um, some people elect to take uh, four courses, which would be 12 credit hours and then 12 plus the, the one hour of professional development that gets you to, to 13. Um, Think about this though, right before you before you charge ahead. Um, if you have been out of school for a little while, maybe you want to start with three classes, right? Um, if you're coming right out of undergrad and you had a very technical and mathematical degree and you feel like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm I'm ready for this, then yeah, maybe you can handle four classes and it's gonna be okay, right? So think about kind of your strengths and your experience um, before you um, enroll in, in in a certain number of classes because we don't want you to get here and then be too overwhelmed and and end up not doing well in your classes, right? Um, it, it's maybe better to take it a little bit slower in your first semester and then ramp up to four classes in your second semester rather than saying, I'm going to take four classes in my, my very first semester no matter what, and then you end up not doing well and things don't, don't go very smoothly, right? So just know that, you know, a full-time schedule is, is nine credit hours. Um, I put a few elective choices here on the right hand side of the slide, but for management science students, you can take anything that you want um, in, in terms of your um, your electives. So these are just some like elective ideas, but you are allowed to take any 6000 level course in JSOM um, that is not a, a core class as part of your elective. So you have a lot of choices. Um, now, your official requirements are in the catalog. And I'm going to um, pull up the catalog here so that you can see what this looks like. And, and the link is here on the screen. This is your is the catalog. The catalog is the official degree requirements for all of um, our degree programs. So when I am a management science student and I go to the catalog, um, I can see here who you know the, the various faculty are, what the degree requirements are, if I have prerequisites, um, that's where Math 6102 comes into play. And then we go down to course requirements, and this is what you want to pay particular attention to. Management science has 12 credit hours of core courses. That would be four classes that you have to do. And then your elective courses are 24 credit hours. Um, that's eight courses. So in total, this is a 36 credit hour degree, 12 classes. So here I can see, OK, I need to take business analytics with SAS or business analytics with R, database foundations or database foundations for business analytics. And that can be kind of confusing because they have similar course numbers and similar course names, but they are actually different courses. I have to take regular statistics or advanced statistics, and then everybody has to do spreadsheet modeling. So that's why in my suggested first semester schedule, um, you definitely want to take your stats course. That is a, the foundational class that everybody needs to do in their first semester. And then I recommended spreadsheet modeling and analytics as another core class that you can do. But you really have some flexibility here. You can take um, another one of these core classes. You could do business analytics with uh, with R instead or your database foundations course in your first semester. You have you have some options here. And then down here in the elective courses, this is where it'll say um, you can choose any you know, course offered in JSOM to satisfy your elective requirements. OK, so that's your catalog, so make sure that you you bookmark this. Um, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and just put it in the chat here um, now so that you can go right to it and bookmark it. It's extremely important that you have this this catalog page saved because it is your official requirements that you're expected to, to follow. The other thing that I have for management science students is an elective choice guide um, because there, there is so there, there are so many options in JSOM that sometimes people um, kind of get overwhelmed with the number of choices that they have. And it's sort of like uh, 
uh, choice paralysis in, in some ways. Um, so I'm not sure if I can upload a file here into the chat. Um, it doesn't look like it's letting me do that, but I'm going to attach that that elective choice guide to my follow up email to you guys so that you can kind of see, OK, if I'm interested in, you know, a, a project management type career after I graduate, what are some of the electives that I might think about taking um, in order to kind of get me there? So I have that elective choice guide um, that I'll send out so that um, so that everybody has that in, in the management science program, because um, I know that when you're looking through all those JSON courses, it can feel like there's a lot of a lot of options. Um, one other note here, um, one of your core classes for management science is that business analytics class, and you'll notice in the catalog here, you have two choices for business analytics. 6324 is business analytics with SAS. And 6356 is business analytics with R. Business analytics with SAS is only offered in the spring. So this is not something that you can do in the fall if this is what you want to do. Business analytics with R is offered every semester. Now, business analytics with R requires the advanced statistics course. So if you really want to take your management science degree down the business analytics road, um, I would recommend taking advanced statistics 6359 so that you can do business analytics with R and that will open up the door to a lot more business analytics courses. Now, if that's not the way that you want to take your degree, then it would be OK to take regular statistics 6301 and then pick up your business analytics with SAS course in the spring. But just know that if you do that, you have to to wait on the business analytics course and take that in the spring um, because SAS is only offered in the spring, but R is offered every semester. But if you're going to do R, you need the advanced stats course. So um, key into your, your question here. Um, it's kind of a, a safety net choice to take advanced statistics because yes, that will uh, that will open the door to more elective options, particularly in the business analytics realm, um, than 6301 will. That that could potentially restrict you a little bit if you take 6301. Okay, I'm going to try to check the chat here um, for some for some questions that are relevant to what we're talking about right now. I'll come back to some of these other questions once we get to the the end here. Um, Priyanka, I couldn't find the class prefix of management science in course book. Is MAS the preferred option? Great question. Um, there is no uh, prefix specific to the management science degree. All of your courses in the management science degree come from other departments in JSON. So, um, for example, here in the, the uh, catalog, you see that you're taking MIS prefixed courses and OPRE prefixed courses. Um, MAS as the prefix in course book, if we go back to course book here, that is kind of a like generic catch all prefix for the entire school. And our professional development course is taught by our career management center. And because the career management center is not a department, they need a prefix that they can use for professional development. So they use mass. Um, mass, I think, is also used for some of our PhD students. You'll see like this research series and it's an 8000 level course. So we we have this uh, that mass prefix to kind of help with all of the things in JSON that don't fit neatly into a department. We, we put it all under mass. But for you as a management science student, all of your um, required and elective courses are going to come from other prefixes in JSON. And if you're curious about which the, which of those prefixes there are, you guys know about OPRE and MIS now. Um, you can actually go back up to here um, in the catalog and go to graduate courses and then do graduate courses by school. And this will show you, OK, um, if I'm down here in JSOM, Jindal School of Management, all of these prefixes right here are the ones that you can pick from um, as a JSOM student. So when you go to course book, if you're like, oh, you know, I'm interested in taking an accounting course, well, then I come back here and I see, OK, ACCT was that accounting prefix, so now I can pull up classes from the accounting department in JSON, and I know that that's here in JSON because it's in this in this table. And again, that's going to be graduate courses here in this menu, graduate courses by school, and it'll give you that nice list that you can pick from. 
very good question. Okay, Sam Rudy, um, under the curriculum, there's this supply chain management track section. Are the courses under the specific tracks core courses or are they electives? Those would be electives. So your core classes are only these four, or these four with, you know, like with choices, right? Um, everything else that you see here on the slide on the right hand side of the screen, these are all elective choices. Yes, good questions. Okay, supply chain students, it is your turn. Here we go, supply chain students. Okay, just like our management science students, you're also enrolling in Math 6102. You're also picking um, a statistics course. And you also need to take 6302, Operations Management, in your first semester. Now, most supply chain students are going to pick OPRE 6301 um, because the vast majority of our supply chain students pick electives that do not require the advanced statistics course. However, you'll see on the right hand side of the screen for you guys under the elective options for first semester students, business analytics with R is an elective choice for you as a supply chain student, and that class does require advanced statistics. So again, just like the management science students, really, if you want to go down the business analytics track a little bit more deeply, um, perhaps you want to take applied machine learning, business analytics with R, um, some of those more advanced analytical courses, then it's a good idea to take advanced statistics in your first semester. Um, if that is not what you want to do, if you see other electives here on this screen or in course book that do not require the advanced statistics course, then you do not need to take advanced statistics. You can take 6301 and you're going to be just fine. So I would say like 90% of our supply chain students take the regular statistics course, but we do have like a good 10% in there that want to um, either challenge themselves a little bit more or open the door to some of those more advanced analytics courses and they'll choose to take the advanced statistics class. And then, like I said, everyone's taking OPRE 6302 operations management. Now, you can also, um, again, think about how many classes you want to take in your first semester. A full-time graduate student is nine credit hours. Um, you could, you could take one, uh, another core class. Um, I would recommend 6371 purchasing, sourcing and contract management as your other core choice, um, or you could do an elective. Um, the other choice there would be accounting 6305. That's another core class for you guys. Um, that's not a bad one to go ahead and get out of the way in your first semester. Now, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the catalog for our supply chain students so that you can take a look at, um, at what your requirements are. And again, this is going to hopefully look very familiar. Um, all of our degrees are laid out the same way in the catalog and um, degree requirements, prerequisites. Boom, there we are, course requirements. You guys in the supply chain program have six core courses, that's 18 credit hours, and six electives. 18 credit hours. So your degree is like half core, half electives. So again, you choose your statistics course, and then you have you have to take 6302, 6366, 6370, 6371, and then you choose either accounting or finance. Now, 6366, you'll notice has a prerequisite of 6302. So this is a class you, you can take in spring of 24. Same thing with 6370. It's a second semester class. You're not going to enroll in this in your first semester. 6371, no prerequisites. So if you want to do this class in your first semester, you can totally do that. Now, your accounting and finance choice. 98% of our supply chain students take accounting. We maybe have 2% that take finance. The reason is because accounting 6305 does not have any prerequisites on it. Finance, FIN 6301, has multiple prerequisites on it. So most of our students, um, it, it does not make sense for them to take 6301, fi finance 6301, because um, you have to have your statistics course either in progress or done. And you have to also have had at least one accounting class before you take this class. And that just doesn't really make sense because you would need to take accounting 6305 before finance. So that's why like 98% of our students are taking accounting. Um, so this is also not a bad choice to get done in your first semester um, if you want to get another uh, another core class done in your first semester. So we're definitely doing stats. We're definitely doing operations management. You could do 6371 purchasing, sourcing, contract management if you want. Accounting 6305 is also a good choice for your first semester. OK, I see a couple questions here. 
Um, will the liberty to choose courses across departments, um, would that incur calendar or schedule overlapping in the future? Um, I'm not exactly sure I understand your question there, Kavin, um, Kavinaya. So if you want to maybe rephrase, um, let me know. Um, you just if if you mean um, that you're allowed to take courses from different departments for management science, yes, absolutely, you can you can take them from whatever um, department in JSON that you that you want. Krishna, core courses are mandatory, right? Yes. That is correct. Core classes are required by everybody in the degree program, whereas elective courses, you're you're choosing um, what you want to do there. OK, um, a quick note, though, also about the counting 6305 um, that is only offered in person in the fall and spring. So that's why um, I recommend students go ahead and take that in either fall 23 or spring 24, because um, I know a lot of our students like to go off and do internships in other parts of the country um, and they want to take their classes online while they're doing those internships in other parts of the country. And you can't take accounting 6305 online. Uh, in the fall or spring semester that that class is being offered online this summer. So the accounting department has offered it in this in online in the summer before, but I usually tell supply chain students to be safe. Just take it in person in fall or spring. Um, that's going to. Really save you a lot of, of headaches down the road if you get that class done. Um, Chia Chia, great question here. Can we really choose OPRE 6301 and OPRE 6302 together in the first semester? Because you see the prerequisite. You have, you're doing great. You're finding those, finding those details on the courses. Um, the answer is yes. And I'm going to point out here, um, hopefully you see on the screen here, when you hover over the class, um, it, there, there's a, a distinction here. If it says prerequisite, that means the course must be done before you take the class. In this case, it says prerequisite or co-requisite, and a co-requisite means that you have to take the classes together. So if you see co-rec, that means at the same time, prereq means one before the other. So in this case, we're telling you take these classes together. And you'll actually see that on accounting, or sorry, on finance as well prerequisites or co-requisites. Um, you don't have to do accounting and stats before you take finance, but you can take finance if you are in accounting and statistics simultaneously as co-requisites. So yes, um, great question and an important distinction to make when you're looking at, at course descriptions, um, prerequisite versus co-requisite. Um, yes, and we'll have plenty of, of uh, elective options for first semester students. Um, I listed a few here on the screen. Um, just check the prerequisites on them. There might be a few that are really meant for second year students, but I want to say most of these, if not all of these, are classes that you can do as a first semester supply chain student. Um, so you have a lot of elective choices during your first semester. Uh, OK, Inchara, question here. Are credits of prerequisite courses counted towards the total credit count? No. Prerequisite courses do not count towards the 36 credit hours that you need to graduate. And that's why about 95% of our students graduate with 37 credit hours because professional development is that extra one credit. Um, and that's fine. You can graduate with more than 36 credit hours. That's not a problem. Um, but just know that Mass 6102 and OPRE 6303 um, are considered prerequisite courses, those do not count towards the 36 credit hours that you need to graduate. Um, and I do have a slide about that, so we'll go into that in a little bit more detail um, on one of the, the next slides here. Um, Sunny, question here. For every semester, we need to complete nine credit hours. Um, if you want to maintain a full-time student load, then yes, you do need to be in at least nine credit hours every fall and spring semester um, to maintain full-time status. Go cool. Question here. Can I switch from the MS program to supply chain? Um, does the change in program require another separate application or can I switch to it immediately? Um, you would need to submit another application if you want to come in for fall of 2023 in the new program. If you get here and it's your first semester in the fall, you can do a change of program um, to, to switch from one degree to another, but that only it takes place once you've actually gotten here and have started your classes. So if you want to come in in your first semester in the new program, um, you should submit a new application 
application. If you need to do that, though, you don't have to upload your documents again. We have all of your documents, like your unofficial transcript and your resume and your letters and all of that. Um, so it's actually fairly easy to do. Um, email me after this if you have questions about that, though, and I can help kind of guide you on that. Is that fair? Question about credit hours for, for internships. Um, you can earn up to three credit hours towards your degree from internships. Um, no more than three. So of your 36 credit hours, three of them can come from internship credits. Kavinaya, I see your question here. Would the class schedules overlap while picking courses? Okay, I got you. Um, you cannot choose classes that have the same day and time. So if you see OPRE 6301 on Mondays at 1 p.m. and then you see OPRE 6302 on Mondays at 1 p.m., you cannot enroll in both of those because that's the same day and time for two classes. You can't be in two, two places at once. So just make sure that you are picking different days and times um, for your for your sections. Repeat what I just said about credits. Um, 36 credit hours to complete your degree, three credit hours of those can come from, from um, can be earned because of an internship. And uh, prerequisite courses do not count towards the total number of credit hours that you need to graduate. Does the capstone elective require us to write a thesis? No. Um, the capstone course is a um, hands-on um, project with a business. Um, it's not a thesis. Okay, I want to make sure that I... Okay, um, I think generally speaking, my, my general advice is to try to complete your core classes sooner than later. <laughs> um, so if you're kind of on the fence about something, I would say choose the core class rather than the elective. Um, but you do have a little, I mean, I think all these degrees offer some flexibility, so you do have a, uh, some, some choice there. Now, these semester schedules were for our fall students. Anybody coming in in the summer, I have a slide for you, and I'm going to go through this now. If you are a first semester student in summer of 2023, then you will be required to enroll in two classes plus professional development. Uh, course options in the summer are slim pickings, so you are going to kind of have to do what I have on this slide here, because there's just not a lot of options for you. Um, summer is a very quiet time. Most of our students are off doing internships and faculty are off doing other things. Um, so, it's a, so we don't offer a lot of classes in the summer. Supply chain students, if you're starting in the summer, you're taking stats and operations management and professional development. That is it. You do that. You're good. Management science students, you're taking stats, spreadsheet modeling and professional development. You do that. You're good. Um, I don't know if any of your other core classes are being offered in the summer, um, but I know stats and spreadsheet modeling are going to be offered this summer, so you should absolutely do that this summer. First semester students, we don't have a lot of elective choices, but again, I don't think you're really going to be taking electives because if you have to enroll in seven credit hours, um, there's just not space for electives, but I've thrown a couple up here um, that our department is offering this summer. Um, and then if you're coming in for summer of 2023 and obviously continuing your degree into fall, you need to register for summer first, which is open enrollment starting Monday. You do not have an enrollment appointment for summer. You should just add classes on Monday <laughs> um, and then wait a couple of days. The system will recognize that you're in classes for summer and then you should have an enrollment appointment for fall of 2023 and then you can add your fall 2023 classes second. So if you're coming in, if you were admitted for summer and you're coming in for summer, start with your summer classes, give it a couple of days, check the enrollment appointment for fall, and then add your fall classes second. Okay, let's talk uh, degree planning and OPRE 6303, and I know I've had, I think, a couple of questions about that. So again, your, your uh, degree is 36 credit hours. I want to remind you that you do need a 3.0 GPA in your core classes in order to graduate, and a 3.0 cumulative total across all of your credits in order to graduate. So sometimes students get a little bit tripped up by this because they're like, oh, I have a 3.0 GPA, I'm good. But then their core classes, maybe the average GPA there is like a 2.9, right? 
and then they're not able to graduate because those the grades in those core classes were too low. So so just be aware um, that you need to maintain that 3.0 GPA in your core set of classes and the cumulative total of everything you take in order to graduate. If you are coming in as a full time student, so international students on an F1 visa, this is you. Um, you are required to enroll in a minimum of nine credit hours per semester. And if you do nine credit hours consecutively, fall, spring, fall, spring, then you can finish in two years. Um, if you take 12 credit hours per semester, then you would take uh, about a year and a half to finish. And we do have some students who do that. A lot of people actually don't do that. I would say that most of our students take the full two years to, to graduate. Um, and there are some internship implications there, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but if you do want to finish your degree in a year and a half, so if you're coming in for fall of 2023 and you want to finish in December of 2024, then you would need to take 12 credit hours per semester. So 12 fall, 12 spring, 12 fall. That'll get you to 36 uh, to finish in a year and a half. If you are a part time student, um, perhaps you're a working professional and you're going to do this degree part time. Um, if you take three credit hours per semester, including summers, that'll take four years to finish. If you do six credit hours, which is two classes per semester, no summers, then three years to finish. Um, if you're a working professional and you want to talk about that, um, kind, of, kind of how to balance your classes versus your, your um, full time job, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm definitely happy to have those conversations with you to kind of determine what the right cadence is going to be for you to finish your degree part time if you're working full time. Um, I'm also going to attach a degree planning worksheet to uh, my email to kind of give you a, a little template to um, to kind of map out what you're thinking in terms of your degree um, and in terms of your course choices. And then check your admissions letter to see if you were placed into OPRE 6303 Quantitative Foundations of Business. If you were um, placed into that course, then you'll take that in your first semester alongside your statistics course. It's designed to be taken in your first semester alongside your regular schedule. And then again, it does not count towards the 36 hours you need for graduation. Okay, Nikhil, how much would a 3.0 out of 4.0 GPA in percentage terms? Um, so GPA is calculated based on your final letter grade in a course. A 4.0 is an A grade, a 3.0 is a B grade, a, a 2.0 is a C grade, and then um, in graduate school, actually we don't have D grades. Typically a D would be a 1.0, uh, but at the grad level we don't have a D grade. It actually stops with C, um, and then an F is worth 0 0.0. So basically a 3.0 out of 4.0 GPA is a B average, and I think in the either in the um, catalog or in the um, or somewhere, actually it is the, the catalog, yes. Let me pull this up here on screen so that you can see. This is our grading system. Um, I'm actually very glad you asked this question because I know that this can be kind of confusing for folks, especially if you are an international student and not used to our grading system. Um, an A grade, like I said, is worth 4.0, a B grade is worth 3.0, C grade is worth 2.0, and then we don't have a D here, um, F is, is zero. We also have plus and minus letter grades. So basically an A minus is like just below an A, it's worth 3.67 and then a B plus is just above a B and it's worth 3.33. So basically at the end of the semester, whatever your final letter grade is in the course, um, those grade points are averaged together to give you your GPA for the semester. So someone who's making all A's will have a perfect 4.0. If you've made a combination of like B plus, B, B minus, your GPA is probably gonna be right around a 3.0, right? So um, this is the the uh, scale here. Okay, Nanda, can we take uh, classes like this? Fall 23, 12 credit hours, spring 24, 12 credit hours, fall 24, six, spring 25, six. Um, the answer is it depends. So if you are an international student um, and uh, then you need to maintain full-time enrollment at all times, there are some exceptions to that. Um, if you get an internship that is uh, considered a full time internship. So students who um, are working in an internship that is more than 20 hours a week for most of the semester can apply for what we call a reduced course load. And if that is approved, then you can take fewer than nine credit hours in that semester. And if it is your graduating semester, it's your last semester before you, you get your degree, then you can be approved for a reduced course load and you can be allowed to take fewer than nine credit hours. Um, but again, those are only in those specific circumstances. You can't just like 
do that without an internship or do that without it being your graduating semester. There are those kind of parameters on that. Um, and the International Students and Scholars Office will probably cover that in great detail in their orientation. Um, but assuming you end up with an internship that you that you work during your second year, um, yes, that is very common for students to do, to do what you've described. Zafir, can a master's student earn a graduate certificate in business intelligence and data mining by taking the mentioned courses? Yes, they absolutely can. Um, if we go back to the catalog, I think I have it in another, um, uh, another tab here. Here we go. Um, if you find a degree, or sorry, a certificate program that you want to um, to to do, you can do that. Um, I the certificate programs I think are nested under. Um, they're either nested under the degree or they're in. Oh, here it is. JSOM certificate programs, business intelligence and data mining. Um, certificates are not degrees. Uh, they are um, kind of a set of courses um, that you can take to earn essentially kind of an extra mini credential. Um, so a graduate certificate in business intelligence and data mining is 12 semester credit hours. That's four classes. And it's going to tell you right here what those four classes are. Um, if you uh, choose these classes as part of your degree, um, then you can um, earn earn the certificate. Um, if this is something that you are interested in doing, um, I can put you in touch with the appropriate faculty advisor for that to make sure that um, you know kind of your plan incorporates that. But yes, if you you know if you're planning to do these classes here for this certificate, you can earn that along the way. OK, Ashi, I see you are admitted for the dual degree in supply chain and MBA. How many total credit hours do you need to complete? You will need to complete, I believe it's like uh, 62 credit hours, I think it is. Um, let me follow up with you in an email separately because um, if you're in a dual degree program, there's a number of courses that will like double count between the supply chain degree and the MBA. Um, and I don't know those off the top of my head. I have like a, a separate guide for that. Um, so let me follow up with you. If you don't hear from me, um, send me an email and then I'll, I'll um, give you the appropriate information that you need. But in terms of what you would enroll in for your first semester, um, you can go ahead and, and, and follow the um, the guidance that I have here in this presentation. Um, that's that's going to be a good place to start. Um, and I would say you probably want to aim for four classes if you're in the dual degree. Um, most students will finish that dual degree in like two and a half years. Um, so I would say definitely aim to, to add four classes for your first semester. Samrudi, how do I know who my advisor is? So we do not have assigned academic advisors in JSON. Um, the entire graduate advising team, um, you can go to them for, for help. Um, so they won't say like, you're paired with advisor Joe Smith and your advisor is Jane Doe. Like you don't have like a person, you just have the whole advising team. Um, so whenever you email that JSOM GR advising at utdallas.edu, um, that, that is who you'll want to contact. Um, and and, and, and an advisor from the team will will work with you. All right. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about internships. Um, I do want to make a, a quick note here on on how that works. This is not something you have to worry about really in your first semester, but I know a lot of students ask about it, so I wanted to include the information here. You are eligible to do um, an internship only after completing 18 credit hours and two long semesters if you are an international student. So that means you need to be enrolled for fall 2023 and spring 2024, and then you do a summer internship in summer of 2024. If you are a domestic student, um, you can do an internship anytime. Your employment is not tied to you being a student. But if you want to earn credit for that internship, you do need to complete 18 credit hours in the program before we will let you enroll in the internship class to earn the credit towards your degree. Now we offer a zero credit hour internship course. So if you don't want to earn credit for an internship, um, you can choose the zero option, which is OPRE 6009 for supply chain and MASS 6009 for uh, management science, and you'll notice second digit is a zero, so it's worth zero credit hours. OPRE 6V98 and MASS 6V98 are what you use to earn those credits towards your degree. So if you want to get your three hours towards your 36 hours, you need to graduate from an internship, then you need to enroll in one of those courses. And now look, the second digit is a V, 
which means variable. So you actually get to choose the number of credit hours that you want to do your internship for. And um, I have a, a handout on how to use internship credits, and they actually cover how to do internship credits um, in your professional development class. So you'll get that during your first semester of like, how exactly am I going to use these credits for internships? It's not something you have to worry about now. You'll you'll get that information once you get here. Um, but I, I put it out here just because I know people are curious like how that works. So that's like the class that you would use to, to earn the credit towards your degree. So like I said, max of three credits towards your degree from internships. Um, if you are a working professional and you're in a full time job right now, um, please feel free to send me an email in the fall and I can give you information on how to use your full time job um, to do a special project that you can use to earn your internship credits. Um, so if you're working full time, just let me know. Happy to guide you on that process. Um, if you think you're going to fail a class or or you do end up failing a course, please come talk to me because um, I've had this where a student uh, failed a course and then retook the course and they thought they earned 18 credit hours at the end of spring and they only earned 15 because they had to retake a class that they failed. So if you're ever in that situation, please come talk to me. Um, come talk to me before you're in danger of failing so that we can have a conversation about like how to how to you know bring things up. Um, I'm here to help you. So uh, please, please feel free to, to come chat with me if you're ever in that situation when you get here. Um, but just know that if you retake a course, whether you failed the class or not, retaking does not earn you credit. So if you if you got a C in your stats class and you need to retake the class because your core GPA is too low and you get an A the second time, you might be thinking, oh, I got a C the first time and an A the second time. I've earned six credit hours. No, you haven't. Um, you only have earned three credit hours towards your degree because it's the same course. So just remember, retaking does not give you more credit hours. You're only earning credit for the class one time. Um, our Career Management Center does have some helpful resources related to internships. It's um, at the link here on the screen. So when you get these slides, feel free to click that link and, and browse the information that they have about internships. And if you are interested in seeing where our students are um, now and last semester and last summer, go on to uh, LinkedIn and type in our hashtags here. And I just realized that hashtag, the first one should just be 1U. It's U-T-D-M-S-S-C-M and then UTD, MS, MSC, um, Supply Chain and Management Science. Um, all of our students who are in an internship course have to do a LinkedIn post. So you can see, um, you can read about their cool internships. And if you're coming in for fall, you connect with them. Say, hey, you know, I'm joining the program in fall. Um, I'd love to learn more about your internship. Um, you know, feel free to, to connect with um, students in the program. Uh, that's what I love about our program. Our students are very willing to help um, help each other. So go onto LinkedIn and just browse and see where our students are doing their they're really awesome internships um, and, and connect with with uh, your your peers that you're going to um, interact with once you get here in in uh, on campus. So um, Kavi Naya, question about internships. How is an internship equated to the credit hours, irrespective of it being a two, three, six month internship? Will it be counted to three credits? Um, good question. So on the CMC website, and I'll go ahead and put this link here in the chat for you guys so that you can um, you can have this information. Um, there is a minimum number of credit hour, or sorry, minimum number of working hours that you need to complete in order to earn the credit hour. So if you go to that link that I just put here in the chat and scroll down to, um, uh, where is it? Rep I think it's reporting and timelines. Um, oh, sorry, secure an internship, internship specifics. It's that second plus sign under graduates. Um, that will tell you how many hours you need to be working in an internship in order to earn the credit. So if you want to do one credit hour, you need to be working at least 80 hours. So that might be like 20 hours a week for four weeks. Um, to earn two credit hours, you need to work at least 160 hours, right? Most of our students are doing internships that are at least 25, 30 hours a week. So this is generally not a, a problem. But if you are wondering, like, how many minimum credit hours do I need to work in order to earn the credit, that website will tell you um, under that second plus sign under the graduate headings. 
Um, Ashi, is it possible to complete the dual degree in two years by taking five subjects in a semester? Um, yes, it would be possible. Um, the other thing that a lot of dual degree students do, I would say virtually all of them take summer classes. So in that summer between your first and second year, you can also load up on some classes then and that'll help you get through. Um, now, in your first semester, it is not going, the registration system is not going to let you take five subjects um, right away. So I wouldn't say don't plan on doing like five subjects in your first semester, but starting in spring of 24 and then like certainly in your second year, yes, you could you could go up to five credit uh, five classes. And and then I think between that plus um, plus summer courses, um, you sh you should be able to finish it within within two years. Um, because yeah, that should yeah, that should get you that should get you there. OK, um, last thing here, international students, if you have questions about your um, I-20 visa, is this schedule going to work for my uh, for my visa? Please be sure to contact our International Students and Scholars Office, ISSO current at utdallas.edu, um, or use their advising options on their website. Um, I don't really know a whole lot about the visa process or the I-20 paperwork. Um, our International Students and Scholars Office are the experts on that, and I want to leave um, all of those questions to them because they know how to answer those questions best. So um, please feel free to reach out to them if there's anything visa or I-20 related um, that comes up. Um, if you're not going to make it to Dallas by the first day of class, I would really strongly suggest that you consider deferring your admission to spring of 24. Um, it's very hard to like get here and adjust to Dallas and adjust to the time zone while you're trying to like start a graduate degree program that can just be very chaotic and I know that students who are in that situation can just be really stressful so if it looks like you're not going to make it to Dallas by like the first day of class um, please consider deferring your admission to spring of 2024 we're happy to welcome you then I'll still be here we'll be around it's not it's not a huge uh, issue um, if that if that ends up if that ends up needing to happen um, it's also important that you report your local address to UTD as soon as possible. So as soon as you secured your housing, um, please make sure that you follow ISSO's instructions um, to report your local address. And again, ISSO, just like me, is going to send all of that official communication to your, your UTD email. So it is very important that you started checking your UTD email, um, log into it, go back to the very bottom and start reading every message that you've received there because ISSO might need something from you. Um, and I've had a few students where they've run into some issues like visa legal issues because they were ignoring emails from ISSO. So please don't ignore emails from ISSO. Um, you have to respond to all of them to make sure that everything's nice and good with your visa and maintaining the visa legally. Um, so please make sure that you're following all the instructions from ISSO. Um, okay, and we talked about holds and bringing your official um, documents with you. Again, only bring it with you physically if that's kind of the last case resort. Um, otherwise, get going on that stuff now. OK, this is my my last slide here. Um, again, read all your emails. It's going to your UTD email now. I can't stress this enough. Um, during orientation, I'm actually going to go around to each of your phones and I'm going to make sure that your UTD email is on your phone. So you can do that now um, and, and get a jump on it. That's how important reading your UTD email is. I actually like went go around in orientation to make sure every single person has their UTD email on their phone. Um, if you have a question for me, I know many of you have connected with me on LinkedIn. I'm definitely happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, I post about like what's happening in the program. So if you're curious to see like the cool events that our students are doing, connect with me on LinkedIn and you can see all the um, the posts that I've made like with our students. Um, but don't communicate, like don't send me a message on LinkedIn if you have a question. Email me from your UTD email so that I have it on, on email. Um, social media is too informal of a channel to be communicating program questions, so so email me um, and anyone else at UTD using your UTD email. We're, we're going into the registration period now. We have 10,000 students in JSON. We are a big school. There's a It's a big operation. So just give us a little bit of time um, to respond to you. I'm usually very fast on email, but our advising office has a huge caseload of students. And so sometimes it takes them a little bit of time to respond to you. Don't worry, they'll respond. Um, just give them a little bit of time because um, it is a very busy period right now when we're trying to get a lot of students registered for fall classes. Um, also, a little helpful hint on email, email one person or office at a time. 
Um, that's one of my little pet peeves is like when somebody emails me and advising and ISSO and another office all at the same time. Um, sometimes you won't get a response then because we don't know which office you're actually trying to deal with. So start with one office, one email. And again, if they're not the right person to answer your question, we'll bring on the person that needs to be brought on to that chain if it's not the right person. So just start with one person. And professionalism is very important. So if you're addressing, you know, your faculty in an email, um, make sure that you call them, you know, doctor or professor. Um, th that's very important to, to be professional in your communications. And I think that's good practice just as you, you know, get into um, get into the swing of things for, you know, your internship hunt and your, your eventual full time job hunt. Um, I already told you you can call me John. So we are we are good on a first name basis, you and I. Um, but for any faculty or other people at UTD, um, just make sure that you're Bearing on the side of professionalism whenever you're communicating with them. All right, we made it. I know that was a ton of information, um, but again, it's been recorded. So if um, if you're not if everything's not sinking in right now, it's OK. Um, you're going to get the recording. You can watch this this weekend um, on your own time and watch it again. You, you're going to get the slides. You can click all the links. You can bookmark everything you need. Um, so I am happy to answer any questions that y'all have. Um, Gokul, I think uh, I see your question here in the chat. Yes, you can bring your official transcripts in a sealed envelope, like sealed and stamped by the university envelope. Um, but if the university is able to send official documents electronically, um, that's really the best way to go because you can get on that now and just get going with things and you don't have to worry about like losing a document while you're flying you know, across the globe. So um, the answer is yes, but try to do it electronically if you can. It's a little bit safer. Nikhil, thanks for the request. I will accept as soon as we get off this call. Um, and yes, definitely happy to connect with anybody um, on LinkedIn. Um, any other questions from folks? Anything um, that we didn't cover uh, that you are wondering about? Hopefully everything is generally clear on what you need to do for your first semester schedule. Back to the first couple of slides. Yes, absolutely. Um, Kian, let me know if this is what you were looking for. The first part here, we talked about course book. Zafair, you sent your transcripts via parchment. Will that satisfy requirements? I think the answer should be yes. Um, but I would double check with the admissions office. Um, I, I think the answer should be yes. Parchment, I, I believe, is, is a way to send um, transcripts officially and securely. Um, I want you to email, so Zafira, this is for you, admission at utdallas.edu. Um, our admissions office is the office on campus that handles all of the official official documentation. So when you send like your official transcript um, and official scores and all of that, it's not actually going to me. It's not actually coming to JSOM. It's coming to UTD graduate admissions, which is like for the whole university. So you'll want to reach out to admission at UT Dallas just to double check that that's been received and that that's like that's good to go. I'm pretty sure the answer is yes, though. Sam Rudy, question here, what percentage of students land an internship and are there any specific qualifications? Oh my goodness, I would say at least like 90% of our students were doing internships last summer. We had a lot of students doing internships. Um, the vast majority of them are, are doing internships. Um, so yes, our students have a great track record of landing internships. Um, the main thing to remember though is that you do need to maintain a 3.0 GPA and complete those 18 credit hours in order to do an internship. So if somebody's academic performance is not up to snuff, they're not going to be able to do an internship. And so sometimes that'll that's why it's not like a hundred percent because we have a you know a, a group of students every every semester who aren't meeting those requirements um, academically, you know, like with the GPA requirement and the credit hour requirement. Um, but if you're doing well academically, that's a great first step to landing a good internship because you know what you're talking about when you go into those interviews. Um, and um, and so there's not any like specific qualification. It's just as long as you're meeting those requirements for for CPT curricular practical training, um, 3.0 GPA, 18 credit hours, et cetera, um, then you are you are good to go to accept an internship. Nikhil, do you need a separate J1 visa? No, no, no. Um, if you're on an F1 visa, that that is all you need to do um, an internship. You get your internship through curricular practical training, CPT, um, as part of your F1 student visa. You do not need to switch visa types um, if you're coming in on an F1.
Oh, Kian, okay, I see your question. Orientation. Um, no, I actually did not cover this in the slide, so that's that's a great question. Um, orientation is kind of a multi-part process, and it's kind of, in many ways for graduate students, it's kind of decentralized. So you're going to have multiple orientations. You'll have one through the International Students and Scholars Office if you're an international student. So you do need to pay attention to communication from them because they run their own um, they run their own orientation uh, for, for international students. I'm going to put that link here in the chat um, because this is not something that is administered by JSOM. Um, this is not something that I have anything to do with. It is our intercultural programs slash ISSO office that does this orientation. So absolutely bookmark this, this link to, um, to know about international orientation. Then for you as a JSOM master's student, you will have orientation. If you're a fall student, you'll have orientation on August 17th. Um, and that's the Thursday before classes start in August. If you are a summer student, you will have a virtual JSOM orientation scheduled for sometime in late May. And JSOM will communicate to you what that orientation, like day, time, location is. I think they're going to send that out in May. So um, you'll get all of your JSOM orientation information a little bit later in, in May, and then that'll be like JSOM orientation, and then we split off by program, and then like all of you guys come in a room with me, and then I give you like program orientation just specifically to management science and supply chain. And, and that is your that is your orientation. It's kind of that, that two part thing. Um, so just be checking your UTD email um, because any office that needs you to complete something as sort of like an onboarding task, they'll communicate that to you via, via your UTD email. If you have a hold in registering for classes, to which mail can I contact you? Um, if it's if it's uh, an academic hold, you should email jsomgradvising at utdallas.edu. Um, and I just put a slide up here. It's um, in number two, jsomgradvising at utdallas.edu. They'll help you if there's a registration hold. Kabinaya, does a teaching assistantship at UTD count as an internship? No, it does not. You will not earn credit towards your degree by doing a teaching assistantship. With the course syllabus, can we also look at the past year's tests? No, that is um, not something that will be public at all. Um, the syllabus is just an outline of the requirements of the class and the topics that are covered. Um, it is not inclusive of any kind of assignment, um, paper or any kind of exam or anything like that. Sam Rudy, is there a platform from where we can apply for internships? Yes, so UTD has a platform called Handshake, and that is our jobs posting board. Um, we have on-campus student worker positions that are posted there, and then we also have employers that post internships and full-time jobs on Handshake. Now, I would encourage you to use Handshake to apply for positions um, when you're going through that internship search, but also a lot of our students um, find internships on their own through other, um, other places. I would say actually a lot of our students are looking Looking, um, at internships on LinkedIn, um, on some other uh, other platforms, so you're not limited to that platform, um, but it is there to, to help you get started. Um, Ashi, question here about uh, MBA subjects. So yes, you'll actually want to go to, your, to the catalog, um, and I'm going to pull the catalog back up here. And you have your, we saw your supply chain catalog. There's also an MBA requirements catalog, right? So we're going to click here on business administration MBA. And this will pull up all the requirements that you need to complete the MBA. Um, so you'll want to scroll down here to course requirements, and this will tell you what you are allowed to do for the MBA. For management science, is it advisable to choose Buon 6320 and OPRE 6332 as core courses in the first semester? Um, yes, that should be fine. Um, let's go back to the catalog here and, and take a look. Um, so Buon 6320 is database foundations for business analytics and OPRE 6332 is spreadsheet modeling. Yeah, you can do those together. That'd be fine. Um, but also make sure you're taking your stats class in the first semester as well. So if you want your schedule to be database foundations, stats, spreadsheet modeling, and those are kind of like three core classes that you do in your first semester, that is totally fine. 
are we allowed to attend the orientation online? For IA, for the inter intercultural programs for inter international students, um, there are some online components to that orientation. Um, I want to say though that there is also an in-person component to that orientation. Um, JSOM orientation is completely in person if you're an international student. If you are a domestic student, JSOM orientation is completely online. Is there a process to apply for TA ships? Yes, but um, teaching assistantships are not something that you can apply for for your first semester. Um, so I can put the link if you want the information about the teaching assistantships just so that you have it you know, bookmarked, um, but this is not something that you can apply for now. Once you get here, um, then you can apply for a teaching assistantship for as soon as the spring 2024 semester. That's the soonest that a student um, could, could be a TA. Can you get a teaching assistantship along with a scholarship? No, you have to choose one or the other. There, there's a triangle basically. Internship, scholarship, TA ship. You can't have more than one of those things in the same semester. So um, you cannot have both a teaching assistantship and an internship. You cannot have both a teaching assistantship and a scholarship. You'll have to, to make a choice. Are there any specific requirements to be met before we apply for a TA position? Yes, you'll see those requirements on this um, at this link that I just put here in the chat, um, but it's it's all based on academic performance. So students who are who are performing, um, you know, strongly um, are looked upon more favorably in the TA selection process. OK, we've hit a natural pause, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, so if anybody watching this recording has additional questions, please feel free to reach out um, and I'm definitely happy to answer any questions that you have.